Hello everybody, John Abdo here, author of Wolves of Croton, The Untold Story of Milo. This is excerpts from a live seminar that I gave some time ago about the mighty Milo of Croton, the man who can carry a bull, the strongest man in history, the greatest Olympiad combatant of all time, who reigned as an undefeated world champion wrestler for nearly 30 years, how Milo changed the fabric of the Olympiad Games, how the committees were forced to change the rules because of Milo's presence, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for joining in. This is my second live presentation to uh, talk about this fascinating man. Obviously, he's one of the original well-known combatants of all time, a uh, seven-time Olympiad wrestling champion. Uh, he was just a great, great athlete, is a real man that really existed in antiquity. He's known as the man who can carry a bull. But anyway, some of the game changers that happened during the reign of Milo were really fascinating to me. And the reason why the book got so big was the fact that originally I was planning on 150, 180, 200 pages at the most. But it got so big because all these different backstories. And when Milo was reigning supreme, when he was doing feats like this, they were changing the rules on the guy. So he actually had several different rule changes during his reign. If you could look at this right here, you could just see all the different competitions he competed in. And when he was competing for his fourth Olympiad wrestling title in 524 BC, they actually changed the rules to prevent against finger breaking. So as I'm doing the research on my little Croton, I was like, hey, there's a rule change. I read separately that there was, that there was a rule change instituted in 524 BC. You can see it right there. 524 BC against uh, finger breaking. And Milo had to have had an influence in making that decision. And the reason I believe is that uh, reading about ancient wrestling, most of them wrestled naked. Some of them put what they call the kind of sign around the head of their penis because they couldn't show the head of the penis. The Greeks didn't like that. They thought it was not proper to, sh to show that, but they could show the testicles and they did so very proudly. But Milo was dominating the sport so much. The guy as powerful as Milo, they were probably just like trying to stay away from the guy. And Milo would snatch their hands and just break their fingers and boom, match over with. I mean, he was just crushing guys just like that. As soon as he grabs their fingers, they would, they would succumb to his mighty force. So he really didn't have much of a match. So they were saying, hey, in order to entertain the spectators a lot more than just and then just drop these guys to their knees, you couldn't touch any other body part to the, to the dirt uh, other than the bottoms of your feet. Certain offensive maneuvers, you could touch your hand if you're going in for a, a, single, a single or double leg takedown, your knee, if you're going in for a high crotch or something like that. But you could only touch the bottoms of your feet in stand-up wrestling. This isn't ground wrestling. Milo competed in stand-up wrestling. We don't know if he competed in other combat sports. Uh, I don't think he competed in boxing. They would have said so. He would have broken faces on that or pancreation. But I don't know if he competed in uh, ground and or stand-up wrestling. And it's also kind of like, uh, kind of like a mystery what is the pit? Was the pit like an octagon today? Was the pit something that was like the whole field? I know Joe Rogan always mentions, let's talk, let's, let's have the fighters just fight in an open area because the cage is a, is, it could be used against you, could be used for you. So there was one called Greek wrestling. They said that they wrestled in the whole arena. So the audience was like, probably like watching a hockey game. I mean, that, that big or even football game. Milo's hands were so strong that when he seized the chariot, even with one hand only, four horses could not make it stir until he let it go. So there was a lot of discussion about Milo's hand strength. And I'm going to read a couple others here. The wrestler would stand with his right arm at his side, elbow against him, and hold out his hand, thumb pointing upward and fingers spread. No one could bend any of his fingers, especially his little finger. So Milo was being touted as having tremendous hand strength 
above all of his other strengths, his body strength and things like that, to where challengers, and these weren't just wimpy guys that just came out of the audience. These were challengers, fierce challengers, some of them even other wrestlers that couldn't even bend his finger when, when he just held his arm to his side. They, they couldn't bend anything. Here's another one. Some have undervalued the famed strength of Milo the Cretonian. Relating thus of him, none of Milo's antagonists were able to force away a pomegranate which he held in his hand. This is from Alien's Various Histories. Alien is a, a Greek historian. So he held a pomegranate in his hand. This woman says, here, my God, here's my, here's my vow, my votive to you, my gift to you. So she gave him a pomegranate. He took the pomegranate and held it in his hands. And the antagonizer says, I bet you we could snatch that pomegranate out of your hands. And he goes, just try to do so. <laughs> and not just one guy, a bunch of guys try to get the pomegranate out of the hand. And, and the historians say that the pomegranate wasn't even damaged. They didn't even bend Milo's finger or anything like that. So Milo's hand strength was really one of the top mentions about his strength, other than the fact that he can carry a bull. And in thinking about this, I spent eight years writing this, and that's why, again, the book got so big, other than Milo's relationships with like King Darius, Pythagoras, Caliphon and Democrates, which were great Cretonian physicians, Timotheus, Milo's younger teammate, and the god Zeus, Apollo, Poseidon, Hercules, things like that. But they focus a lot on Milo's hand strength. And I think the reason is because, again, Milo, instead of going head to head, you know, cup the back of the neck and the back of the tricep, he would just grab guys' hands and just crumble them to their knees. And he was just so dominant in that. So that was in 524 BC. So now let's go to 520 BC. BC obviously in reverse. 524 is before 520. Now Milo is competing in his fifth Olympiad game at the 520 BC Olympiad games. And now they include, they meaning the Olympiad organizing committee, which are called the aliens from Ellis, which is 12 miles away from Olympia, the race in armor. This is not an athletic competition. It is a brazen exhibition of military fitness, intent on pure intimidation. The aliens are bastardizing the truce, violating their own vow. This will only erode the sanctity of the games, an insult to the almighty Zeus. Only corruption could have influenced such a greedy decision. So the hoplitodromos was hoplite soldiers competing at the Olympiad Games, where the Ilian Committee, before the Games started in 776 BC, because Greeks were always arguing with one another, battling for territory, economic superiority, positions along the coastline for ports of merchants, whether it was the Aegean, Ionian, Mediterranean seas. And the Greek Federation, the Panhellenic Federation says, hey, let's have sporting events, let's have fair competition. The fight fought and the battle won in an arena and in a pit with true sworn participants, not just athletes, but officials, true sworn. So the international truce was to allow safe travel for all the pilgrims and visitors that came into Olympia. And you can imagine all the people that wanted to come and see Milo. So in 540 BC, Milo competed at the World Youth Games, became real popular. He was already carrying a bull when he was a teenager. So 540 BC was around 19, just before his 20th annum, as they call it. And then 61, 62, 63, 64, all of a sudden he's just winning all these Olympiad games. So each Olympiad games, <laughs> the, the grassy slopes, not an arena, they stood on grassy slopes under the hot August sun, were waiting for this godman to come. So more and more people came. So it was really important to have a worldwide truce. So now they got the hoplitodromos. And the way I, I, I'm thinking about this is that Milo had such a powerful presence. He's the strongest and most powerful military weapon on the planet. He's the strongest man in the world. No one can beat this guy in a fight. No one wants to dare the guy. He wins a lot by Akaniti. Akaniti means I'm not going to wrestle this guy, which means no dirt or he, dustless or he never even steps foot inside the pit. And he's just winning match after match after match. Uh, Simonides, who is a Greek historian, who literally was almost the same age as Milo, which, which I consider one of the more uh, credible sources, Simonides, and I'll read uh, something from Simonides in just a second here in the book. But 
Simonites mentioned that Milo of Croton would walk around the arena with a bull on his back, thrilling his fans who would slap the loins and tug the tail of his colossal bovine pet. Here's another quote here uh, about, uh, about Milo's popularity. Milan, Milo Milan, Milan, this fine statue of a fine man. He won seven times at Pisa, which is Olympia, and never dropped to his knees, which is Simonides. Simonides was born in 556 BC. Milo was born in 559 BC. So Milo was three years older than Simonides. So could you imagine being the same age as Milo, going to the competitions and watching Milo? So Simonides is one of the more credible sources on Milo. There was Pausanias, you had Herodotus, you had all these different historians writing about Milo, and they were well past his time. Plutarch here was 433 years after Milo had passed away. So carrying a bull on your back as a warm-up to get into all these different Olympiad games made Milo so popular that he dominated the world. He was considered a god, the mortal son of Zeus, the second coming of Hercules. And then all of a sudden, after finger breaking, which was no big thing, Milo was breaking other bones than that. Four years later, they instituted the Hoplitodromos, which was the race in armor. So let's talk about that. First off, what is the race in armor? All the running events at the Olympiad Games was stayed, and I got the dates when they began, 776 BC, Dialois, which is 724 BC, and Dolichos. So stayed was the most popular of the event. This was the Usain Bolt. This was the sprint. It was approximately 190 meters, about 623 feet. The Dialois was twice that. That debuted in 724 BC. 1,250 feet, give, give or take. And the Dolichos, depending on the mood of the committee, they would say, ah, let's let him go 12 times, 12 states, or 24 states. So it was on the mood of the committee. Only one placer, not a second place. They didn't keep time. Stayed, they just ran across the arena. And Dialis, they would run and come back. And then Dolichos, back, 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 back. But then the Hoplitodromos, which is the race in armor, which debuted in 520 B.C., which was 204 years after the Dialis was, uh, was instituted into the games. It was run with hoplite soldiers. They had helmets on, they had shields, they had what were called hoplons, they had swords, they had breastplates or cuirass, they had greaves, which were like um, a baseball catcher's, you know, shin guards and bushkins. And I got some quotes here on and some of the, the ways that these guys just must have felt, because you can imagine that running across an arena in August in the hot Greek sun, and they talk about the heat, the humidity, the discomfort of the event, how the athletes were sweating all the time. Here, the scorchingly hot sun added an exhaustion factor dehydration from excessive perspiration, especially during the dialysis and all-out sprint that stretched up to 1,200 plus feet. Sprinting naked at maximum acceleration was an imposing task in and of itself. Now consider an athlete clad with up to 70 pounds, 70 pounds of uncomfortable military garb, and many hoplites were simply unfit for the task. So for those of you out there that are into exercise technique, especially running technique, you know you use your arms and your hands to pace your stride. Now you're holding on to a hoplon. Some hoplons weigh up to 22 pounds. They got the helmet on, they got the breastplates. So let's, let's talk about that. A metallic leather uh, helmet could either be all metal, could be all leather, a combination of the two. A helmet pivots from a sweat-drenched forehead, suddenly blocking the soldier's vision. He runs off course, collides with other runners. So you can imagine these helmets. I mean, you see these uh, hoplites, you know, in their phalanxes with their helmet. They look so intimidating, but they're dying underneath this metallic helmet. I remember when I played football back in Illinois, obviously you start training camp 
in mid to late August and it goes through the whole, you know, fall season, couldn't wait till it got cold out or whatever. But inside the helmet, I think it was like something like 150 degrees or some crazy, crazy amount. So uh, helmets were super uncomfortable, sweat just dripping down their eyes. If you're holding on to a, a, a hop on or a shield and you got a, a, a spear or a pike or a sarissa, whatever you want to call it, in your hand up to 20 feet in length, it's like, how do you wipe the sweat out of your eyes? Breastplates, which are those cuirasses, right? Fastened during normal respiration, restrained and necessary expansion of lungs and rib cages and diaphragms when men sprint across the track, inducing hyperventilation, resulting in asphyxia and an occasional death by suffocation. So if it didn't happen during the hoplitodromos, it certainly happened when they were in phalanx positions. And I put, put a circle here, because can you imagine? This is 16 and 16. It's one of the more popular phalanx formations. Those of you who are into ancient military history know of numerous other phalanx positions, but this was one of the more popular ones. But can you imagine being clad with 70 pounds of military armor and be in any position, let alone within that circle right there, how hot, how obstructive it is. It's really, it's really an inconvenience to say the least. So that was breastplate. Now breastplates, as I, as I said here, fastened during normal respiration. So same thing with the cuirass. They were, they were tightened in place by their trainers or the, uh, the military aides during normal respiration when they're standing. But when you start running and you're huffing and puffing, you, you need... Uh, you need expansion because of the diaphragm, the lungs, the rib cage. You could only imagine when they're sprinting in a, in a race. Gripped by one arm, bulky hoplons weighing up to 22 pounds, wooden disc of round, rectangular, or square design, staggered gates due to flailing strength in arm and shoulder muscles, deforming postures that cause shields to bounce off hoplite thighs, digressing strides from states of linear locomotion. I know you guys lift dumbbells and the kettlebells and rocks. And so hold on to a kettlebell like this and hold on to a spear like this, or maybe just like this, right? You got the helmet on, you got the tight breastplates. We'll talk about the bushkins and the, and the greaves in a second. And you're running at full speed. You got no, nothing to, to balance yourself in. It's just, just such an uncomfortable position. So all this was competing against Milo, right? Because... Not only did this shock the world that they were going to have another event compete against Milo, it was almost like, you know, Milo was their most popular athlete. And an analogy I give is like, I lived in Chicago when Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan. I'm a former strength and conditioning coach. So I used to be in the training center when Michael, Pippen, uh, Rodman, all those guys were, were training. So you can imagine when Michael was Michael, any event, and he's competing, and at the other side of the stadium, they got some circus going on. It's like, wait a minute, you know? I mean, obviously, there's going to be some distraction, some delusion of interest, uh, delusion of interest from, from MJ. And this here is uh, uh, Milo of Croton that they're taking uh, the attention away from. But nonetheless, I think that the, uh, that the committee made this decision because Milo was so dominant in the sport of wrestling. He was just destroying people. He was known as the, not just the toughest wrestler in the world. When you're the toughest wrestler in the world, because wrestling was the number one combat sport, boxing was popular, Pancration was popular, Arician of Figalia was super popular because he won three Olympiad Pancration titles. He lost his life defending his last because he didn't tap out when he got choked to death and his opponent did at the same time and Arician was granted the victory even though he was dead they posthumously gave him his victor's crown here he is dead they're carrying him around the arena with uh, the sacred olive wreath on his head but Milo of Croton I believe swayed that decision to uh, let the committee and they're a greedy bunch of people. I mean, some people say, if the aliens had money or if Zeus was rich, why did they just give an olive wreath as, as a crown? If Zeus was rich, he would give them gold. But I believe that there were some uh, other alliances that persuaded the alien committee, say, 
we need to get our armies into this competition. So it was, uh, I believe it was Milo. I believe it was Milo, Milo's dominance. And if it wasn't 100% Milo's dominance, it sure had a lot of influence, had a lot of influence on finger breaking because in 528 BC, that was announced, hey, we're going to institute a rule that's going to make it more fair for the wrestlers, not Milo, make it for, fair for the wrestlers who wrestle Milo of Croton. So it was, uh, it was one of those things where uh, uh, in doing the research, I'm just trying to read between the lines and it just dawned on me, <laughs> you know, hundreds of pages later, that the backstory to the backstory was that Milo uh, had, a, uh, had an influence on this. And finally, there are those greave straps and bushkins which unravel during the sprint, tripping the soldier over his own bootlaces, who happens to fall onto his shield and knocks the teeth out of his mouth. This is written by somebody else. I mean, it was, it was, it was just unbelievable that uh, uh, this here, uh, they talk about the lackluster performances, it demoralized their city-states, the, um, uh, they were criticized uh, for uh, their inferior raw materials because the Greeks had a lot of pride. On my land, I got the best olive trees. On my land, I got the best spruce and oak trees. On my land, I got this. On my land, I got that. So they all fought for territory. They all fought for uh, provisions and sustenance and the gifts from the heaven, which, which were the botanicals, the wildlife, and obviously the uh, topography, which I'll get into topography in a second here. But uh, a lot of historians just say it was a comic relief. Ironically, the fifth Olympiad Games, which was the introduction to the Hoplotodromos, Milo's fifth Olympiad Games in 520 BC, it was a sensational hit. Again, comic relief, because it wasn't the winners of the competition like everything else. You get second place and everything else, you go back home, they slice your throat, or they're throwing you in, in, in jail or in prison or in slavery, a life of hard labor or whatever. So you can't get second place in a lot of these uh, competitions under a lot of these rulers, i.e. tyrannical rulers, where they were executed or fined or punished. In, in some capacity, but from a spectator standpoint, it was fun to watch. And because Milo was just waiting for an opponent at the 65th Olympiad Games in 520 BC, and everyone says, I'm not going to wrestle this guy. He's already won four Olympiad titles. You think I'm going to get in the pit with this guy? He just walked around the arena carrying a bull, literally carrying a bull. And I'm going to go into the pit with this guy. The other thing that kind of like uh, struck me about the Hoplitz Dromos was how did the hoplite athletes get to Olympia? So if you know Peloponnesus, which is pretty much like a peninsula in Southern Greece, is completely surrounded by water. On the east side, it's the Aegean. On the south side, depending what direction you're coming from, it's the Mediterranean or the Cretan Sea or the Sea of Crete, depending. But for these hoplite soldiers that came in from land from the north, they had to march through the Peloponnesus. And what are all the battles over? Territory. So these guys are walking through. Hey, what are you doing to my lands? Oh, we're going to go compete in a competition. But oh, there's that guy's treasury. And I see that guy's triclinium. And that guy's bibliotica, which is their library or their scriptorium. You think they got secrets in there? Oh, I seen some gold statues. Oh, we're just going to the competition. So the march into Olympia that they came in from the Aegean Sea or the Mediterranean, what did they have their triremes docked at the harbors over there? It's so intimidating. These are naval military vessels and stuff. So a lot went into writing this book. Obviously, Milo is known as the strongest man who has ever lived. There's a lot of backstories that go in with uh, with Milo of Croton. And uh, th just the, the announcement of finger breaking, no big thing. Wrestling was the most governed of all the sports. So the game started in 776 BC, which stayed. That's the straight sprint. Then in 708 BC, they had the pentathlon. Pent means five, athlon means athlete or competing competition or what have you. And that included stayed, discus, javelin, long jump, wrestling. And the reason why there's an asterisk by discus is because when I dove into the research, Homer's got a reference that says that the discus started in 776 BC. I never found a reference where the, uh, where the Olympiad Games, when they were founded by Hercules, had any other event 
than state. It was just an all-out sprint because that was the most popular. In fact, a lot of the state athletes were hoplite athletes, but it was too short for hoplites because a lot of battlefields were a lot longer than 1,200 feet. There's an asterisk by wrestling, and the reason is because was wrestling introduced as a single event and combined with the pentathlon, uh, wrestling itself started in 708 BC, boxing 688 BC, pancreation 648 BC. So this is the progression of the different uh, sports, give or take, uh, according to uh, several historical accounts. All right, so think about this. You have these hoplite athletes, these hoplite soldiers, soldier athletes. These soldiers trained like athletes. Athletes trained like soldiers. They wore military garb, either on occasion or all the time, because that was the military training, is to keep your body in great shape. You need to throw spears, you need to block arrows and spears, and you need to run, and you need to have overbearing force, and you need to also have uh, stealth capabilities as well. So go into these games with the tens of thousands of spectators there. Is it plausible? As some of these athletes, when they looked into the uh, arena, when they looked into the stands, that they seen family members of people that they killed, they had blood on their blades, they had blood on their spear tips, they even, may have even collected anatomical body parts, where they had, uh, one, one guy could say to another, hey, see that guy up on the slopes over there? Yeah, his son, I drink my wine out of his empty skull casing. And another guy said, I got that, that guy's son's hands. I got that father's genitals because he came to our city and raped our women. It's not only plausible, it has to be a fact because they're always in war with one another. So uh, the coaches, the trainers, they are probably military men too. Commanders, generals, captains, or, or what have you. So it was just unbelievable to learn all these different things. I've been studying this Eight years, maybe, most of the focus was on my little croton, and all of a sudden, I started expanding. It's just an incredible story. And it's like, I got to write about this. The first time I'm writing about a guy, how did this guy, first off, want to lift the bull? How did he get a chance to lift the bull? And how long did he continue to lift the bull? I appreciate you joining me. Thanks for watching. Those of you who read the book, I really appreciate it. Please like, subscribe, follow, all that fun stuff. And uh, we'll see you again soon. I'm John Abdo, thanking you for watching. Stay strong and healthy, and perhaps one day, thousands of years from now, people then will be remembering your name as well.